Okay, this is uh, Jim Head uh, introducing the Solar System Exploration Virtual Institute Origin Ev Evolution of the Moon course. Uh, I'm at Brown University and together with David Kring at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston, uh, we'd like to introduce today's lecture, number 12, in our series in the Origin and Evolution of the Moon. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us today Lindy Elkins Tanton of ASU, Arizona State University, to talk to us about models for the thermal evolution of the moon. Lindy uh, is the director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. She's also the principal investigator of the PI on um, the Psyche mission, the Psyche asteroid mission, which was selected in 2017 as the 14th in NASA's discovery program. So Lindy has had a very, continues to have a very distinguished career. Uh, her research really focuses on a wide variety of things, very exciting. It includes theory, observation, and experiments concerned with terrestrial planetary formation, magma oceans, uh, and subsequent planetary evolution, including magmatism uh, and interaction between rocky planets uh, and their atmospheres. She also promotes and participates in education initiatives, in particular inquiry and exploration teaching methodologies and leadership and team building uh, for scientists and engineers. Uh, Lindy received her bachelor's and MS uh, master's from MIT in uh, 1987 and then spent eight years working in business with five years spent writing business plans for young high-tech ventures. Um, and she then returned to MIT for a PhD uh, and uh, working with Tim Grove and others. And she spent five years as a researcher here at Brown University and then followed by five years on the MIT faculty uh, before accepting the directorship of the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism at the Carnegie Institution in Washington. Uh, she moved to, um, 20, in 2014 uh, to the directorship at Arizona State University. Lindy is, as you will see today, an extremely accomplished researcher and an excellent communicator, uh, one of the best in the field. So, Lindy, let me turn it over to you. And uh, we'll, what are you laughing at? Uh, I'm just laughing. I've got a lot to live up to, man. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That was a great, a great uh, introduction. I appreciate it, and I'm really glad to be here today to talk about one of my favorite things, which is the thermal evolution of the moon. Um, through this, through this uh, talk, I put together. I, I rather selfishly focused on my own results um, with, uh, with references to others, but then you'll see at the end, I've got a summary slide, and then, uh, and then uh, you're, you're certainly welcome to um, distribute, if you want to, the final slide, which we won't look at, is just a bibliography of all the data that went into that summary slide, so it's kind of a nice um, uh, summary of, of the field, I think. So I'm going to talk about the thermal evolution of the moon as, as requested, but I'm going to talk about it um, in the context of, of how we know and what we infer, so how it relates to the rocks and the chemistry. You go to slide, uh, next slide, solidifying the, mag the lunar magma ocean. So this is where I'm going to start with the solidifying lunar magma ocean. And I've, I've looked over the rest of the, of the course that you all have had and the wonderful speakers and, and so many of them, my friends and collaborators. And so um, I'm guessing at this point that a lot of what I say is going to be review and maybe, and maybe uh, summation and uh, tying together things that you already know. Um, it would be very interesting to see where things that, that I might um, assert or state uh, are, are in conflict with, uh, with where you've come in your understanding of the moon or where we agree, um, but I think it's gonna tie together a bunch of threads. If we go to the next slide, I've got this pie slice. Solidification to the point of a floating lid on the moon is very fast. And so, and so this is just a schematic, a cartoon that I'm using to show uh, the concept that when a magma ocean cools, uh, the solidification proceeds upward uh, from the bottom. And so convection is always driving warmer liquids up toward the surface, the boundary layer, which is the, the main, the main um, uh, heat transfer layer, is that surface layer at the, at the top of the pie slice. And then that, that cool boundary layer of the liquid magma ocean goes unstable and drips downward. In, in downward plumes, and uh, eventually those plumes um, cross the solidus of the material in pressure temperature space, so it's mainly a pressure effect, and then they dump their, uh, their solids down onto the, the bottom. So we have growing layers of, of solid cumulates at the bottom of the putative lunar magma ocean um, growing upward toward the top. Go to the next slide, or just the next click, um, uh, Burkhardt et al. 2014, um, in fact, showed from molybdenum isotopes that, that formation of the lunar core uh, occurred at a metal silicate equilibrium temperature of about 1800 degrees. 
And so, and so that's an interesting uh, data point that supports the idea of a, of a whole moon magma ocean. There are many, many arguments about how deep the magma ocean might have been on the moon. Um, I, I think that the idea that aluminum content is the is the is the uh, constraining factor is, is not the case, and so we have to look for other ways to decide how deep the lunar magma ocean is. So here's one data point that says it was the whole way, but you can get arguments from several hundred kilometers all the way up to the whole the whole moon. Um, so then for the next slide, just a brief discussion of the of the um, the calculations that go into it. We're right now, at this stage of the lunar magma ocean, we're looking at solidification um, through a free surface, through a liquid surface. And so this can be uh, simply calculated. And if you click once forward, you'll see a circle around the term on the left of this equation. This is a total planetary heat flux. Uh, so flux out of the surface of the planet, 4 pi r squared times f is the flux. Um, and that can be uh, written as equation, which um, as the summation of, if you click forward one more, You'll see the second circle, and that is uh, the sum of the latent heat of crystallization of an increment of the magma ocean. So we're going to freeze a little part of it, and that's going to give up the heat of crystallization and actually heat up the magma ocean a little bit. So that's one piece of, of heat that goes into it. And then if you click forward one more time, we'll get the final term, and that is the secular cooling of the planet, simply the cooling through the surface. And so if you, if you add the heat in from crystallization and you allow the heat to go out the top of the planet, that is the sum. And um, you can then uh, calculate the total heat flux uh, out of the surface or indeed through an atmosphere using that equation five um, uh, there. And so it's an interesting argument how much of an atmosphere the moon might have had around it at this stage, Cer certainly highly varying from the beginning of the solidification to the end. Uh, but that's a bit of a controlling parameter, actually. And if, and if there was um, if there was a big plasma or gas atmosphere around the Earth and the Moon at the very beginning, that would have significantly slowed down the heat flux. But this is this is the simple math of the of the of the heat loss, which determines the solidification time scale that we'll talk about shortly. So the next slide, of course, how the Moon solidifies. Uh, or solidified from its magma ocean depends um, very much on what its composition was. And the composition then determines the order of mineral crystallization. Um, but unfortunately, neither the bulk composition nor the fractionation sequence of the cooling moon are known. Uh, and so here's a table that I put together a few years ago of, of the range of ideas people have had about the magma ocean bulk composition. Um, and you can see a very wide range um, in silica, relatively wide range in silica. Um, uh, uh, not such a gigantic change in, in Mg number, all a high Mg number around 80. Um, but things like aluminum, a wide range of different gases in aluminum, a lot of that is driven by the fact that the uh, lunar white colored highlands are largely made of aluminum bearing feldspar. And so if you could assume that all the aluminum floated up to be in that lid, then the rest of the magma ocean might have been relatively scanty in aluminum and helped to constrain its depth and total composition. But unfortunately, we can't know how much aluminum is sequestered in the lunar mantle in aluminum-bearing pyroxenes and in interstitial liquids or in, or in um, accessory minerals. So hard to know exactly what our lunar magma ocean is uh, in bulk. Uh, the next slide shows two fractionation sequences. Uh, the one on the left is one I used um, in 2011, and the one on the right is the classic Snyder et al. Uh, and so the, the vertical axis here is the percent solidified by volume of the lunar magma ocean from zero to 100. Um, and in each case, you can see that both of the bulk compositions would start with pure olivine fractionating out olivine that is significantly denser than its coexisting magma and would happily stay settled at the bottom. Uh, the composition I chose for my study would then have crystallized a very large fraction of orthopyroxene, OPX, plus olivine, while the Snyder one goes to just olivine, um, but in, 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 I mean, just OPX. And then you can see up closer to the top around 20% around to go or around 80% solid by volume. Both of these models begin to crystallize AN, anorthite, um, the calcium N member of the feldspar uh, triad. And so that is, 
is your beautiful floating white material that forms the lunar highlands, um, co-crystallizing in my model with olivine, orthopyroxene, and clinopyroxene at the beginning, and in the Snyder model with just olivine and pigeonite, which is a low calcium pyroxene. And both of our models at the end um, uh, begin to also crystallize oxides, and that becomes very important because they're so heavy compared to the coexisting liquid. Uh, so even though these are different fractionation sequences, they don't, in the end, make a gigantic difference in the thermal evolution of the moon. If we could go to the next slide, uh, here we see a, a graph that has the density of the material across the horizontal axis, and then the radius of, moon, of the moon on the vertical axis. And in this model, I assumed that the lunar magma ocean was 1,000 kilometers deep, uh, and so it goes from uh, seven, uh, 26 to 1726, is that right, or 34? Jim, what's the radius? I just can't remember the last two numbers. Um, 1736, I think. 36, 1736, thank you. Uh, so if we start looking at the very bottom, you can see it's the same as the fractionation sequence I just showed. There's one line for interstitial liquid that's the same density as the bulk magma ocean liquid um, and it's co-crystallizing with olivine. You can see the olivine is denser than the interstitial liquid. And as you rise up um, in the sequence, we're crystallizing from bottom to top. Orthopyroxene also begins to um, co-crystallize. And then when you get up very close to the top, plagioclase or anorthite starts to crystallize. And, it, and an interesting point here is that in, that in most of these models where we're allowing the magma ocean liquid to evolve in composition while we fractionally crystallize out the olivine and then the orthopyroxene and finally all the other phases near the end, Clinopyroxene, you can see there in red, is also buoyant with respect to its interstitial liquid or to the rest of the magma ocean liquids. And it would, in these models, um, in a simple sense, you know, this fairly simple-minded, pure fractional crystallization model, clinopyroxene would also float along with the anorthite. And it might offer a solution for the fact that we find pyroxene in some of the ferroin anorthocytes in the lunar highlands. A little bit hard to understand how that would be, but perhaps this is the answer. It also floated. And so that is the um, chemical evolution that happens. And we have to do the chemical evolution and the physical evolution together to understand the thermal evolution. And you'll see why in a moment, if you don't already know. Let me go to the next slide. So to, to, to summarize the part of the solidification that goes up until the floating lid begins to form, you know, the time that, that uh, it still has a free surface boundary Solidification is very, very fast, um, uh, potentially as fast as, as 10,000 years, some very, very quick time, depending a lot upon um, vigor of convection. Um, and it goes to the point where, we, where it's a little bit hard to actually model the fluid dynamics because it's possible that the Rayleigh number would be so high. Um, things like turbulent diffusion becomes very important. And also not knowing how much of a of a vapor or plasma atmosphere might have been slowing down heat flux. But anyway, this is the fast part of the process. And if we go to the next slide, the next 20%, uh, the last 20%, takes between 20 and 200 million years um, after just uh, some number of thousands or tens of thousands of years for that first 80% by volume. The last 20%, anorthosite uh, starts to form. And as we saw in that density slide, it is buoyant with respect to the coexisting liquid, so it floats up to make those beautiful rock bergs and floating lid that, um, that Wood and Smith uh, um, uh, pr uh, predicted based on the Apollo return samples that have been uh, studied so um, deeply by so many of, of our colleagues and people who've spoken to you already. And so the last 20% of the mafic cumulate pile, the iron and magnesium bearing is still growing upward and the anorthosite lid is growing downward. We go to the next slide. Um, here is the density uh, outcome of this. If you if you look first, um, this this graph has also got density along the horizontal axis and radius of the moon on the vertical axis, the same radius range as the density graph I showed you before. But the density graph I showed you before was um, individual phase by individual phase, and this is the um, the the bulk assemblage at each at each um, depth into the moon. So if you look just at those dashed lines, not at the solid lines, but at the dashed lines, that's the, uh, those are the density profiles for the newly solidified moon all the way up to the surface with different percentages of trapped interstitial liquid. That's very important if you're looking at trace elements and water 
um, but not so very, very much for the bulk, um, for the major element chemistry. You can see that, that in each mineralic layer, like the bottom layer where you have a sort of a monotonically increasing density as the olivine gets slightly and slightly more iron rich as crystallization proceeds, and then it jumps back to a little lower density around um, 1050 kilometers radius when orthopyroxene starts to crystallize. But again, as crystallization continues, density rises as, as the minerals become more iron rich. And then you come to a very dense layer just underneath the floating lid, and that's because of those heavy oxides. And then finally, the very last bit of the moon um, here about um, 40 kilometers, just less than 40 kilometers, is, is uh, just anorthite and a little bit of pyroxene. And that's um, floating and rigid and cold, and it's going to stay up there. But the rest of the, of, the, of the profile there is unstable to overturn. And this was a really important idea that Hess and Parmentier and Spira worked on um, quite a lot uh, back in the um, late 80s through the mid-90s, and, uh, and a concept that, that I've, I've taken up again um, very strongly, as have others. It has a lot of important implications, and it looks like it's almost unavoidable that at, right after solidification or even during solidification before it's finished, those um, soft but gravitationally unstable and solid cumulate mantle would overturn. So the dense material sinks to the bottom and the lighter material rises up and it has some very important consequences. You can see now in the solid curves, that's what the density profile looks like after overturn. You have the densest oxide bearing materials down at the bottom and then you have a monotonically decreasing density profile up to the bottom of the lid. Um, and so if we go one more slide, um, just uh, let's see. So just to state that overturn likely occurs during this period of solidification while the anorthosite lid is still growing downward and the mafic cumulates are growing upward. And with one more click, um, I can explain why. And this is work from Whitehead and Hess and Parmentier and then Zarenek and Parmentier. If you look at the time that the, the T sub RT in that equation, time of the Rayleigh Taylor overturn of these dense cumulates that want to sink down and the light ones that want to rise up, um, it's inversely uh, um, uh, related to the thickness of the layer D squared. And so as the layer that's unstable thickens, the Rayleigh Taylor overturn time um, shortens um, precipitately. And it's also inversely. Um, related to gamma, which is the steepness of the density gradient. So, so through the olivine and orthopyroxene layers, um, they still are prone to overturn, but on a much longer time scale because their density uh, steepness is, 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 is small. But then after the um, oxides begin to form, the, the overturn time speeds up quite a lot. And if indeed solidification takes 200 million years, then overturn will be complete before that period ends. So then on the next slide, we're going to put it together with a little bit more information. On the left, you can see the pre and post overturn density gradients that we just talked about. And on the right hand side, finally, back to the thermal history. So here's the cumulate mantle temperature in Celsius plotted against the same radius. Um, and on the right hand side, if you see that, that uh, very smooth dashed line that goes from about 800 near the surface of the moon to just over 1600, at um, the bottom of the magma ocean, that is our calculated solidus for the fractionally solidifying lunar uh, magma ocean. Uh, and so it, it curves over at the top near the surface because the liquid has been so highly fractionated that it's really quite a different composition than when it started and it's freezing, temperature goes down and down and down. So that is that smooth curve, the dashed curve on the right-hand side, that's the thermal profile of the lunar interior right after it finishes solidifying. All the materials would lie along their solidus right up to the top. And what happens when it goes through that density-driven overturn is it carries the temperature with it because overturn is faster than thermal diffusion. And so the, uh, the material just advects its temperature along with it into its new location in the moon. So you can see that post-overturn, the, the bold lines on the right, if you look at the, at the very bottom of the post-overturn, you see material that, that's colder than 800 degrees. Uh, and so that is the, the, those oxides that started out at the oxide assemblage, oxide-bearing assemblage, that froze just under the anorthosite lid 
sunken all the way down to the bottom and carrying its cold temperature with it. And so you can see from the post-overturn profile, the, the first thing that you see is that if it's a first order, hot material from the bottom of the magma ocean has risen buoyantly right up to the top under the lid. And the other thing that you see is that cold material from near the surface has sunk down. But then in that green range, the radius range of, of what I'm calling azimuthally heterogeneous cumulate mantle, you can see two bold lines, one that's around 500 C and one that's around 1200 C. Those are um, identically dense, but compositionally and thermally different parts of the original cumulate pile one, that have um, risen to the same radius range because they have the same density. So they would be heterogeneous around the moon as a moothly. And that is super interesting because that is the same radius range that the picritic glasses originated from. And you can see all of the multiple saturation points, the, ex the uh, experimentally determined uh, temperature and pressure of origin of the of the fire fountaining glasses from the moon, and they and they overlap that heterogeneous mantle um, it, uh, range almost perfectly. And that um, I have to tell you that freaked me out when I first calculated that. I thought maybe I'm onto something here, um, because one of the mysteries about those fire fountaining glasses is they come in a range of of titanium contents from very high titanium to almost zero titanium. And a question would be, how can the low degree partial melts of the lunar interior have such different compositions when they came from pretty much the same depth? And maybe the answer is that the moon is really heterogeneous at those depths because of overturn. And then um, you can also see where the Mari basalts come from, a little bit higher up in the moon. Um, now, all of those, uh, all of those materials, the picritic glasses and the Mari basalts, erupted um, long after this overturn event. Because this whole event would have been um, uh, completed um, several hundred million up to a billion years before the eruption of these, of these basalts and picritic glasses. And so their, their thermal story would be different, but their compositional story might be, um, might be told here. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, um, we'll see one of the outcomes of this of this um, of this thermal history. So recall on the previous slide, we talked about how the hottest material from deep in the mantle was also the most buoyant in terms of its density, and it would have risen up to very close to the surface. And that's what I'm showing here. Again, it's the same radius on the vertical axis. But on the horizontal axis, instead, I'm showing the mg number, um, the molar magnesium as a fraction of magnesium plus iron, of the bulk cumulate mantle. And what you can see in the slide are um, where these cumulate assemblages ended up after gravitationally driven overturn. So you can see that, that same, um, a similar curve in bold to the temperature curve you saw in the previous one, but this is actually an mg number curve. They correlate with each other because mg number of the freezing cumulus um, changes uh, close to monotonically as fractional crystallization uh, goes along uh, along a smooth solidus, and so the two are are, are changing at the same at the, in the same way. And so what you see here is is up near the surface, um, olivine plus or orthopyroxene from the lowest part of what was originally layer two, with a very high mg number ends up right underneath um, anersite. And it ends up uh, rising up at a pretty high temperature. And in fact, we posit um, uh, crossing solidus and partially melting. And so this, we propose, is perhaps a way to make those MG sweet rocks um, that, uh, that intrude um, the, the anorthosite um, highlands in so many places and are part of the crustal suite. Um, but seemingly strange because they have such a high mg number. And this is a way to, to form them because of the thermal history of freezing and overturn. Uh, go to the next clip that shows a, a nice um, summary of the Lunar Highlands MG Suite from Shure 2015 uh, it, for, for, for a, a bit of a review. Um, and so then finally, on the next slide, um, one of the final pie slice pictures um, creep, which I'm sure you're familiar with, the potassium rarest elements and phosphorus, the last few percent of magma ocean liquids, 
they're also something that we can begin to think about modeling um, this way. And, and they're a bit of a you know, wonderful mystery. Um, uh, were they, in fact, the dregs of the magma ocean? Can you achieve them through fractionation? We see the traces of them in creep-rich basalts, but, um, but nowhere do we find an unadulterated um, uh, you know, pr primordial piece of creep. So what was that original creep? If you go to the next slide, you'll see a table. And I tried, um, I tried some experiments with, uh, with different um, bulk compositions and, um, and uh, freezing sequences. And if I assume that the last 8% of the liquids are, are more or less creep, or what we might call, or what others have called ore creep, the original, the primordial creep, um, these three compositions end up being quite different. And so they're highly affected by model assumptions. You can see the first one ends up with an MG number of 36, and the second one ends up with an MG number of 70. <laughs> they end up with um, quite different chromium contents, different titanium contents. Um, everything is different about them, um, except that you can see that they're all rich in iron, and they're all rich in aluminum. And so they are a very, very strange liquid. Um, but the problem is that with this kind of first-order modeling, because we really only have first-order knowledge about what to put into these models, we can't, um, with any fidelity, reach answers about things that are just a fraction of a fraction in the end. And so, and so this just shows how, how model-dependent these kinds of um, predictions can be, and so they, they end up being not very useful, except for as an object lesson about the limitations of modeling. Um, then on the next slide, let's see. Um, I guess I really talked enough about this previously. It's just that same right-hand side showing the thermal history um, post-overturn and then where the Mari basalts and pitgritic glasses came from. So let's go on to the next. Um, so that is, that's kind of the end of, um, of, the, of the early thermal history of the moon part of this. And then I wanted to talk about two other things um, that are that are thermally driven evolution of the moon models that result in either predictions or confirmations of observations. Uh, and to me, that's the really interesting thing about trying to understand the distant thermal history of the moon is, um, can we actually uh, predict something that, that we see? Uh, that's, that's when it becomes important. And actually, if you just go back one slide again to that radius versus cumulate mantle temperature graph with the big green band, um, I started out working on the moon um, with, with Tim Grove a long time ago, doing some of these pigritic glass multiple saturation point experimental sets. Um, I think some of those 15s are mine and a 14, um, and, uh, and the rest are done by other, by other researchers. But it, it blew my mind at the time to think that if I spent a year doing experiments in the lab based on a lunar composition, that I could actually predict what the what the temperature and composition was inside the moon 3.5 billion years ago, <coughs> excuse me, I thought that was pretty great. And so then to um, put together all of that hard-won data about where those uh, materials came from, those volcanic materials, with the model uh, that, that predict forward what the moon might have been at that point, um, that was just, that was exciting to bring together the observation, the experiment, and the model. And so that's, that's to me what we need to be doing all together. All right, so onward to creating the dikes in the lunar lid. Um, the next slide uh, shows uh, GRAIL gravity data. Um, sorry, it's a bit of a fuzzy picture that I just um, hacked out of uh, Jeff Andrews Hannah's and, and that whole team, Maria Zuber's team, from their science paper, showing those linear gravity anomalies that they found, um, that they found in the crust. So what they, what they discovered was that there were these, these dense gravity anomalies that were linear and that they were consistent with being dikes that were injected into the otherwise less dense lunar crust. And so they said, well, for dikes to be injected into the lunar crust, um, the, the moon must have expanded and created that room for the dikes to come in. And they predicted a 0.6 to 4.9 kilometer expansion of the lunar radius to allow those dikes to fit. And so, and so I thought, well, maybe I could say something about lunar expansion or contraction. And so I started working on this with, with Jade Berkovici. We had a lot of fun doing this. Um, he had part of a sabbatical down at Carnegie, and, and we did, filled a lot of whiteboards <laughs> with equations. Um, and the next slide, I, I think I just have these two slides about this, this particular study. Um, so let me talk about this, about this graph for a little bit, because I, I, I think it's just 
an interesting way to think about the moon. Um, on the vertical axis, this fraction solidified of, again, a thousand kilometer deep magma ocean. I just used my existing model, not that I think I know best, but consistent model with what I've done before. From nothing solidified up to 100% solidified at the top. And then on the horizontal axis, this total radius change. Um, now, if we start following those three curves, um, models one, two, and three, and if I remember correctly, they differ um, in composition primarily. Um, I really would have to look back at the paper again to remember exactly how they differ. So excuse me for not remembering perfectly um, how those three models differ. Uh, but you can see when they're crystallizing olivine only. They, they start, we start with a, with a certain radius, which is the, the magma ocean um, uh, completely liquid to a thousand kilometers. And as they crystallize olivine, of course, what happens in the magma is, is turned into a dense mineral is that volume is lost. And so while the olivine is crystallizing, the radius of the moon is shrinking because it's converting a less dense phase into a more dense phase. And then um, after it's, the magma ocean begins to crystallize um, olivine and orthopyroxene, uh, models one and two continue to lose radius because they're still um, converting to a more dense phase and losing volume. The model three comes out about even. And then um, at point eight, uh, fraction solidified, um, anorthosite begins to freeze. And the anorthosite is buoyant and therefore less dense than the coexisting liquid, and so it is, it is creating a volume increase. Now, up to the point of, um, of point 0.8, right to the point where the floating lid begins to form, nothing that happened before matters, whether the moon was shrinking or whether it was expanding, which there's almost no way to do that. Um, none of that is going to be recorded for later. The only way we're going to record any kind of expansion or contraction is once the flotation lid begins to form. And so we really only care about what happens for each of these models between 0.8 and 1. And so the moon always ends up smaller than it was when it was fully molten, but it might have shrunk for about 80% of solidification and then expanded. And so in the end, our, our models, um, our preferred model, is about 4% of, of, of radius expansion. Um, uh, uh, model 2 and Model 3 are the, most, are the most accurate ones, we think. And so, and so in the end, our, our predicted expansion during the formation of the, of the crust is, is, um, is almost exactly what, what the GRAIL team um, also predicted. And um, with overturn and the creation of the um, high magnesium we, through overturn melting, potentially, we have a way of forming and filling those dikes while expansion is occurring. Um, let me go to the next slide. And I'm, I'm going to um, just indulge myself by, by talking with you a bit about, um, about filling the giant basins with basalt. And um, this was a, a model that, that we did years ago, and I just really, really enjoyed it and um, think it's interesting. Um, if not definitive, but it, it relies very strongly on predictions for the thermal evolution of the moon. And, and I found it instructive in thinking about what the interior of the moon might be like, and so hopefully that's true for you too. All right, so uh, wait, before we go to the next slide, while we're still just looking at that text slide, filling the basins with the salt, um, of course the problem we're trying to solve is why are the giant older impact basins, the late heavy bombardment basins, filled with all that dark basalt? And some uh, newer um, impacts are not, you know, maybe the lithosphere of the moon, that is the, the mechanical lithosphere, the thick part of the moon that's not convecting um, and creating melt. Maybe it just got thicker and thicker and shut off the supply. Um, maybe the impacts themselves had something to do with um, allowing that basalt filling. And, and there's been so much good work on this, and I, I don't mean at all to imply that I've got the last word. Um, there's so much to be read um, on, on uh, the very, very uh, careful measurements that Jim Head and his team has made, and also the density calculations of Mark Wazorek and Maria Zuber, and, and all kinds of different teams have done this. And so this is just a little um, contribution to that, to that big, that big uh, literature. And so on the next slide, um, I'll just show uh, the schematic, a cartoon about how a giant impact can produce volcanism. Uh, so I've got, um, I've got a process and a duration and then these cartoons to read from the top down. So at the top, um, and again, I'm just looking at a cartoon, which is a slice into the moon uh, through the crust 
um, which is gray, and into the mantle, which is white, with the impactor striking on the axis, so you just see half the impactor. So at the top, crater excavation creates um, some in-situ decompression melting. And so the very top one, which takes just minutes, is that giant impact. And if you look at the next one, you'll see um, that the crust now has been excavated and thrown away. So you have, you have that kind of half crater with the peak in the middle. Um, and the fact that that mass has been taken away uh, from has been excavated out of the crater over minutes to hours, depressurizes the mantle immediately beneath, and if it's warm enough, can create melting. At your leisure, if you want to, you can look at the, the blow up of that on the right, which shows the relationship between the, the uh, selenotherm, the thermal profile in the moon, and the solidus, and how that creates that melting zone right underneath um, through decompression. But the part that I really want to focus on are the, are the final three parts of that cartoon. The next one, with the big fat upward arrow, the lithospheric dome forms from immediate liquid flow or later isostatic rebound. So the, the crust has been thinned, um, but for it to reach isostatic rebound, it actually needs to dome upward a bit, and it needs to create that dome in the bottom of the crust as well as the crater in the top of the crust. And so that's gonna happen on minutes to thousands to tens of thousands of years. It's a um, similar process to why uh, Scandinavia is still rising and new, and new, um, new uh, uh, land is being created all the time there because uh, the last ice age, although it's been gone for, for order tens of thousands of years, um, the, the isostatic rebound of the crust is still occurring while the crust rises up to reach its density. Um, equilibrium. And so the same thing would be expected to happen to the crust under these under giant basins on the Earth and on the Moon and, and everywhere else, um, that the, that the uh, mantle immediately underneath is going gonna, is gonna to bulge upward and the crust is going to rise and it's going to create a dome in the bottom of the crust. And what happens when you've got a dome is it inspires convection in the mantle underneath. And you can see that in the second to last where there's the curvy arrow that goes up in the middle of the crater and down along its rim and can create a decompression melting zone right underneath the mantle as the, as the mantle material that's warm enough rises upward. The reason that that um, effectively umbrella-shaped convection, since we're just looking at one half of it, occurs is because um, there's now a horizontal temperature gradient from the warm, white-colored mantle in the middle underneath the crater, the new dome, and the cooler gray crust um, as you move further away from the crater. And so the, that creates an upwelling in the middle and a downwelling on the edges. And you can see here also that the, that the models, and th these are cartoons based on, um, on the um, uh, you know, finite element uh, um, convective models on, on big codes that calculate all of this. And the models predict that uh, in many cases, the edges of the dome on the bottom of the crust would be pulled down into that little downward cusp. And um, that actually matches what is seen in, uh, in the gravity uh, map for, for a number of, of the bigger um, basins on the moon, as you actually see um, a, a gravity high in the middle where the dense mantle is, is up the mask on part, and then a, then a thin rim of gravity low right around the edge of the mantle. And, and we would hypothesize that's because of the thickened crust there, the thickened low density crust from that convective um, process. And so the question we asked was, um, if this simple process, which is just predicted from physics, occurs, and if the temperatures inside of the moon are, um, are what we think that they probably were by this time, would we have created enough basalt just from the process of making the basin to fill the basin? And so if you go to the next slide, um, this, uh, I think I've just got two slides on this effect. So this one has pressure on the vertical axis from zero to three GPA, which is the same as zero to about 600 kilometers depth. That's on the right-hand side. And on the horizontal is temperature. Um, in this, in this uh, um, simple model, I just showed the solidus as a straight line. Um, I put on all those multiple saturation points for the, for the picritic classes and the Mari basalts that you saw in the previous slides as well. And then, um, and then I drew two adiabats, one at um, 1350 and one at 1450. Those are the thin straight lines that go right from the bottom to the top. But, um, but we also estimate that there's some thickness of 
conductive lid on the moon, some thickness of material that isn't um, that isn't uh, convecting, and we and we assumed it was about 200 kilometers thick. And then you see this vertical arrow, thermal effect to the giant impact, that effectively um, thins the crust and moves that um, selenotherm, the 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 um, the uh, temperature profile inside the moon upward, allowing melt to occur. And then in yellow on the right, you see the depth range of melts that are produced in this study, um, everything between about 120 down to about 550 kilometers depth. And so the, the question or the thing that we're hypothesizing is that these melts um, produced using this thermal model and the process I just described um, could in fact have created a lot of the Mari basalts that would have risen and re-reacted and stalled a bit in the sphere and then, and then erupted. So then the, the final slide is, um, is what the volume of melt is compared to the ra radius of the crater. And so, um, so the, the, dark, uh, the dark line here is the mantle potential temperature of 1450 C, and the, and the Grayer line are the same models run, but with a mantle potential temperature in the moon of 1350 C. And um, I ran uh, four different crater sizes, which you can see as the dots on those lines, the solid dots. And on the vertical axis, is showing the total extrusive melt volume. I assume some fraction of the melt is trapped um, without erupting. And then I plotted there also in the in the in the in the empty circle. Um, the volumes that are predicted uh, by Solomon Head and, and Wilhelm um, uh, for the amount of basalt that was erupted into these different basins. And, um, and so I, I think it's at least um, interesting to see that if those 1350 and 1450 mantle potential temperatures deeper in the moon um, did exist around the time of the late heaven bombardment, and that's consistent with the thermal models I showed you earlier, then um, the bombardment itself might may have created the Mari basalt. And so let's put it all together right here at the end. Um, and if you go forward to the first slide that has the billions of years before present on the horizontal line, and, and I know, um, I, I don't really know who's online, but I'm guessing a bunch of you have seen various of these of incarnations of, of, my, of my giant put together all the date slide, which I'm sort of obsessed with. And this is even a new one that I made just for this talk. And uh, so I hope you're not too bored with it, but I'm still kind of fascinated. And, and you can see um, on, this, on this slide, uh, the far left-hand side I've marked as the first calcium aluminum inclusions in the solar system. And for this, I chose um, sometime around 4567.5. So you can see in red up at the top. And um, the little J that's next to it and the little N next to Mars are, um, are reference numbers. And so the, the final slide, which we um, don't have to look at, um, but it's got the list of the references for all the different um, ages and models that I'm going to show. And so, and so this, is, this is the relatively new information um, from Martian meteorites and the relatively new modeling that shows that Mars was fully formed in just a few million years and that Mars's magma ocean solidified extremely fast. And now we have some uh, earliest individual minerals found on Mars um, uh, around 4.475, which is really, really, really far back. And I just love putting Mars on this because Mars was long finished before the moon or the Earth were done. Um, Mars really is a stranded embryo and it's had a much simpler life than, than our Earth and, and moon were much more complicated. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about the moon. We'll take one click forward, and now you can see um, uh, all the ages that I've been able to collect from the literature, um, starting with core differentiation in red, and that's all tungsten hafnium ages, and um, I think that the very best one is E, the, the farthest to the right, the youngest, with a very long error bar, um, saying that core differentiation on the moon happened really at, at the extinction of tungsten and hafnium. Um, that's Tubul. And so uh, then we've got the Pharaoan and North site, so that's that flotation crust. And so, and so this is an interesting story because I, I just put all the data up here. Um, you can see, uh, if you look at the Pharaoan and North sites, you can see a date far to the right that says P with a square around it, and one in the middle that says Q with a square around it. Those are um, each ages from the same exact sample done by different labs at different times. 
Same with M and H. Same exact sample, different labs, different times. And you can see that some of them have got huge error bars, some of them have tiny error bars. And so um, it raises the perennial question of um, whose data do we really trust? Uh, and what is the story with these complicated and difficult rocks? And so rather than saying, well, I don't think that person's data is correct, I'm going to throw it out, I've just put all the data there for us to consider. Same with the MG suite, which is in yellow. Um, in general, younger than the furrow and orthocytes. Um, but some very, very good modern dates in both cases, both P with the, with the square around it for the for the furon and orthocytes, and Y and S with the squares for the MG suite, some very good recent dates. And then, uh, then the or creep, um, people's estimates of the age that creep formed. And so these things, of course, all tell different stories about the thermal evolution of the moon. So the furon and orthocytes, when were we freezing the last 20% of the moon? The MG suite, when were we creating um, the, the, some sort of magnetism that happened right after that? And then the ore creep, when did we create the last dregs of the magma ocean, which might have come before that MG sweep. So the order could be core differentiation, forming furrow and anorthosite, making the creep, making the MG sweep. But we don't know for sure. So one more click forward and we'll look at the Earth. Uh, there's been recent work that you see in the left on green, uh, in green on both noble gases and, um, and isotopes that actually make predictions for when mantle differentiation happened on the Earth. When did our mantle um, um, divide or, or crystallize into the different regions that it has now? Um, those are really important and interesting ages, and particularly the K, the noble gases, saying that, um, that this was happening up until that date. Because if the moon was created by the last giant impact onto the Earth, then that was when our mantle differentiated the last time. And so, and so the ages of these things are connected. Then you can see um, around 4.38 is the very oldest extant individual minerals on the Earth's surface. And so the moon forming impact had to have been before that happened. There had to have been time for the Earth to solidify and to create crustal minerals before 4.38. And then around 4.3, there are those zircons that indicate that there was liquid groundwater in the Earth and that it was clement. So together, all of these things put strong constraints on the thermal evolution um, and the timing of the giant impact. So uh, one more click, and we see the moon forming impact. Um, there are estimates of the ages, um, the bar that's marked E and the bar that's marked F. And then um, and there's this one that I just marked Elkins Canton in purple, which I drew on um, a few days ago. Um, one more click forward, and you'll see that I was just doing the thought exercise, you can see the arrows now, the purple arrows, I was doing the thought exercise of how the Earth determined when the moon forming impact had to be. It had to be after, um, uh, no, that should have been before, should the mantle differentiation event, it should be just to the left of K. Um, uh, and, and it had to have plenty of time, um, I think I drew that wrong, I'm so sorry. It had to have happened um, before the, before the, um, the mantle, uh, differentiation event. It had to have happened before K. So I, I drew this quite wrong, and I hope you see how I drew it wrong, um, that it had to have happened before uh, the mantle differentiation on the Earth. So it sets it back a little bit. Um, but the point is the same, even though I drew it embarrassingly wrong. Um, and the point is that, that uh, I think that it's a really nice way forward to think about how we can use ages on the Earth and ages on the moon to determine the moon forming impact. So then finally, um, let's get back to the, the heart of the story with one more click, and we'll fill in the rest of the chart with the models for lunar magma ocean freezing. Um, so, so H and I are, are the top two orange bars are both um, papers that I've been involved with, and G is a paper that comes out of um, NIMO's lab. Uh, and so, and so in, in our models, we show that solidification of that first 80% of the magma ocean um, up to the point where a northocyte is forming, is, is finished in, in, in a very tiny thickness of that bar. Now, if nothing else happens, the moon was just sitting there in freezing space by itself, it would freeze um, by this last 20% conducting through that anorthosite lid in about 20 million years, about 23 million years. But uh, we don't think that's actually what was happening. We think that it was constantly being tidally flexed as it went around the Earth 
and as um, as it as it uh, um, drifted away from the Earth, starting around around six Earth radii and just outside the Roche limit, out to its current 63, it's flexing all the time. And the and the tidal um, heating and flexing uh, actually slows down the freezing considerably because the tidal heating actually heats through friction the interior of the Moon. And in our models, we found that it heated the flexing anorthosite crust so much that parts of the crust would remelt and erupt onto the surface. And so we would anticipate that there would be parts of the anorthosite crust that were formed primordially by, by flotation and other parts that would be completely recrystallized by melting and flexing in the tidally heated lid. And so, um, and so that, um, that estimate actually agrees with NIMOs. Um, that it could happen uh, um, even more longer than 100 million years, and it and it actually matches the the length of ages of the foreign foreign anorthosites um, in a fairly satisfactory way, depending on what dates you believe. And so I, and so now with the with the, my realization that I drew my purple line wrong, I would I would move that back to be just before K. Um, although you know who knows, all of these ages are are uh, are. Um, are subject to revision as we get better and better instrumentation and better understanding. Um, we can take those models and slide them um, backwards or forwards to, to match whatever data we have at the time. But at the moment, it's looking like um, uh, you know Mars was done long before this really ever happened, and that's certainly using Taboul's information and the ages we have um, on core differentiation and the ages we have on the crustal materials and mantle materials both on the moon and on the earth that um, that, that it, it can help constrain the, the age of, of the giant impact to be, uh, you know, maybe 4.45 or a little before that. And that if we have tidal heating in the lid, then we can explain as long as 100 to 200 million years of different anorthosite uh, crust ages, uh, even though the flotation lid itself would have formed um, uh, it, perhaps in less than 20 million years through flexing and melting and re-eruption, we would expect a very wide range of anorthosidic lid ages. And so that is um, that's the end of my, my summary of, uh, of the thermal evolution of the moon. And I hope that it fitted in with the rest of your course very well. And I really appreciate your listening today. Lindy, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, needless to say for all of you out there, it's very clear that Lindy is an, indeed an extremely accomplished researcher and an excellent communicator. So really excellent. It was very complimentary to all the discussions we've had so far. Um, we appreciate it very much. Our tradition is to um, open the for discussion. Um, we have uh, comments taken from the chat box and from the class here at Brown and elsewhere. And um, so uh, Ariel Deutsch will um, communicate some of these questions to you if you would be so kind as to uh, field them, so to speak. Ariel? I will do my best with many things. <laughs> Thank you. So our first question is, um, you spoke about the source regions of Mari basalts and pacritic glasses. So our question is, if the irregular Mari patches observed on the moon are evidence for a very young lunar volcanism, perhaps in the last 100 million years or so, from where in the lunar interior would you expect these magmas to have originated? This is, um, oh my gosh, I, I wish I had an answer for that question because um, one of the things that I, that I neglected to, to show here was uh, an image of the vector field of the convecting interior of the moon as we modeled it for the, during basin formation. So that would be two billion years before these um, putative very young basalts. And convection is so sluggish on the moon. There isn't a big enough gravity field, and there isn't a big enough thermal gradient, and it's just pretty slow business. It's just creeping along. Um, and it's not um, helped by addition of, of great amounts of volatiles like it is on the Earth. And so trying to figure out how we could still have melting in the interior of the moon um, a billion years ago or less than a billion years ago is, is an amazing problem, because you would really expect the exterior to be getting colder and stiffer and colder and stiffer and thicker through um, through cooling so that any kind of convection, any kind of um, adiabatic melting of, of, of rising up mantle would be um, really increasingly difficult. Plus, um, not having subducting slabs like we have on the Earth filled with volatiles that reduce the melting temperature 
um, I think it's a wonderful problem. And so, and so I'm, I'm telling you this kind of story about how hard it is to create melting in the present day to say that I really would not have expected it at all. And so, and so if it's true that these basalts are super young, um, you know, that places all new constraints on um, maybe the roughness of the bottom of the conductive lid of the moon so that mantle materials could conduct up higher, or maybe um, volatile rich pockets of, of last creepy materials with, with little concentrations of water and carbon and things that would allow extra melting. Um, there's something really important going on there, and I do not have um, a guess based on any real good reasoning of, of where it should come from or what it should be made of, but I sure would love to have some samples of it. <laughs> so so how's, that for, how's that for a non-answer? That's, that's what I got. <laughs> No, I think that's that's great. I mean, it, it it's a really big question. Is you know, as you say, it, it puts into question the details of the broad scale thermal models. If in fact there's any kind of volcanism on the moon in the last 100 million years or less, and so we really need to be stretching our thinking and kind of like outside the box to think about possibilities. And of course, a lot of people have suggested that perhaps they are a different composition, and so uh, that is to say, maybe magmatic foams or other types of uh, configurations that would result in anomalously young ages. So it's a really important yeah. debate and an example of the kind of thing where all the new data coming from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and, uh, you know, all the young minds uh, that are putting their um, uh, attention to this is, is really, really productive. I mean, we can discover fundamental things uh, about the moon that raise fundamental questions. So it's a great answer. Right. That's so right. And, and just to urge all the young minds, that if any are out there online, you know, try not to fill in the interstices of work that other people have already done. Go find something that really answers a bigger question. And this is an example. If we could understand where those materials came from and under what conditions they formed, we would have an entirely new constraint on the evolution of the moon, something that would change the stories we've got now. Thank you, Lindy. Over to Ariel again. Our next question is, um, you discussed the critic glasses and placed in volatile rich corruptions. Are there any reasons to think that post-overturned mantle sources that you've discussed would be volatile rich? The, um, in general, the volatiles that we're talking about, everything from hydroxyl, um, maybe water, carbon, sulfur, um, they're all incompatible with, um, with uh, the, the normal suite of crystallizing minerals. And so they all get enriched as fractionation of a lunar magma ocean goes forward. And so we would expect um, the final dregs, the ore creep, to be the richest of all in any kind of um, volatile. And, um, and indeed we can match, you know, we can match the expected um, volatile, vol the water content of source regions of, of different um, um, lunar compositions through fractional crystallization. And so the answer is that, um, is that in, in the simplest case, if we expect all of the late stage crystallizing material to sink through the density of the oxides, then we would expect the most volatile rich material to be down at the bottom of the mantle against the core, which doesn't really help us with the picaritic glasses. <laughs> but um, it's also very likely that some of that material was more or less frozen in place and unable to overturn, and then you would have pockets of volatile rich material stuck to the lid, which is a great way to have them added in or create, you know, create fire fountains, um, or maybe some of these late foamy things that we might we might um, um, hypothesize for the for the late eruptions. And so those are the ways that volatiles get um, concentrated or um, or removed from cumulus and some ideas about where they might end up. Um, thank you. So our next question is from the LPI. It's was the LMO wholly solidified when mantle overturn occurred, or was there a residual melt? If the latter, what was the residual, or sorry, what was the radial thickness of remaining LMO melt? Yeah, it's, it's likely that overturn began um, before all of the liquid was completely crystallized, um, especially if tidal heating kept some portion of the magma ocean liquid um, through that frictional heating. If there was no tidal heating, 
um, then the magma ocean may well have been fully solidified before it overturned. But the likely story is it was not quite fully solidified. But there's no way to um, to say with any degree of certainty um, uh, how that would be. You know, the the the, um, the simple equation that I showed for the time scale for overturn. Um, uh, we don't even know for sure all of the variables that go into that, and there's more to it than that. You know, it's a more complicated, longer term, not just the first um, big blobs, but a process of uh, of overturn. So I, I wish I could tell you the answer. Um, I, I would say that the likeliest is that there was a layer of liquid between the flotation lid and the overturning cumulants, but um, but how thick and but its composition would be, um, I would say that that is really unknown. Um, so this question is about some of your own research, um, and the Raleigh-Taylor instability is influenced by the viscosity of different phases. So the question is how you deal with these variations in viscosity due to changing magnesium number or Fe content. Right. Um, in, in the simple equation that I showed that just gives you that, that main time scale, we would just um, we would look at, at at bulk viscosity, assume that it was dominated by the major the major mineral phase, and then um, the big controller would be actually temperature, uh, mm -hmm. since for mantle-like compositions, every hundred degrees is an order of magnitude in viscosity. Um, we could assume that they're all near their solidus, and so that would might put their viscosity near 10 to the 18 Pascal seconds, but we don't know. You know, we don't have several orders of, ten, of, of 10, orders of magnitude in there that could be fooled around with. So that's how we handle looking at that equation. But then um, in, in a couple of different studies, we've tried to do a much more detailed job um, putting in uh, uh, more complex viscosity laws that vary with um, uh, uh, temperature and also stress state um, and pressure and, uh, and looking at it in, um, in a finite element um, code that is able to handle all different length scales of instabilities and 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 look at that, look at it that way but you know all of this is um, it's all approximation based on what we know now and um, and all the answers can be moved to some degree one direction or the other within the parameter range of known numbers and so so this is something that I try to really think about in modeling and urge other people to think about that um, the only really good conclusions you can take from models are the zeroth and first order conclusions that are within your error bounds um, of, of what's known right now. And um, and the uh, uh, more complicated the model is that you build, um, actually the less sure you are that the results you're getting are really the effects of the physics that you're interested in. And so and so there's always those questions. Uh, so so that so we try to do it both from the simple analytical way looking at the range of parameters and also with um, more complicated finite element codes that, that um, take into consideration uh, more differences and spatial and temporal differences. And, and the answers are pretty consistent. Um, uh, and, and I guess that's, that's the, where we are with that study now. Um, we had a follow-on question that was also asking how you deal with the effect of partial melt on the influence of your bulk rock um, viscosity. So I'm guessing it's the mm -hmm. same sort of approach. Right. Um, and, and so so for the parts of the of the cumulant pile that we assume to be solid, um, we assume that there's some interstitial melt, but never enough to um, be fully connected. We assume that it's mostly squeezed out through the force of um, compaction through gravity, and so that it wouldn't be fully connected. Now, the problem of, um, imagine, that cumulative overturn has begun, and there's some sort of creep-rich, really sludgy, multi-phase goo between the top of the solid cumulus and the anorthosite lid. Um, the question is, is that going to be dragged down during overturn because it's also very dense? Is it going to be decoupled because of its quite different viscosity? Um, what is going to be the fate of that material? And I know that's something that Mark Parmentier has thought about quite a bit and has been doing work on, um, but I don't know the state of that work. That is um, a really difficult thing to be confident that we're doing it well. Great. So our next question is, um, so you discussed how the thermal or the compositional regime of impacts might favor one style of volcanism over another. On the moon, there doesn't seem to be a strong link between basin impacts and style of volcanism. However, there 
seems to be a stronger correlation between craters and pyroclastic deposits on Mercury. The question is whether you can discuss why some of these differences might exist. Hmm. Um, I don't have uh, well-formed thoughts, but I, I can't resist but speculate a bit, um, true to my academic training. <laughs> and so um, one thing that springs to mind is that is that um, giant craters, you know, you get a melt sheet that's, uh, that's right at the bottom of the crater, and then you maybe get adiabatic melt that's going to rise up from underneath. Um, but you also, on the Earth, um, stimulate... Uh, um, large amounts of um, volatile flow in the crust. You know, there's a big thermal gradient um, laterally as well as um, as well as vertically. And and so I wonder um, I wonder on Mercury. I wonder if other places it could um, stimulate um, uh, um, volatile interactions interactions from within the crust. Uh, but that's just that's just wild speculation. <laughs> okay, great. And our final question for now is what is the time scale for volatile outgassing during magma ocean crystallization? And is it reasonable to expect that the generated supercritical atmosphere would have formed any buried lunar hydrated minerals? Hmm. That looks nice. Um, <laughs> well, so that's really interesting. We think, I think, that... Um, that the moon probably started with hundred or hundreds of parts per million of water, um, so a couple of orders of magnitude less than what the what the Earth started with, and um, at, at, at we would infer um, if you for the Earth if you start with too much I can't give you the right number because I don't have it in front of me but very much more than what we've used in modeling um, the problem is getting rid of the water where do you do with that giant steam atmosphere? It all gets blown away by the young star. You know, why don't we then have bigger oceans? There, there's, um, this is something Kevin Zonley's talked about. Getting rid of the water is harder than putting it in. Um, you basically never get a magma ocean that's saturated, that's, um, that, that gets to the point where it saturates the minerals that are, that are crystallizing. So you're never going to change from, um, in, in any kind of scenario for the Earth or the Moon, you're not going to get hydrous minerals crystallizing from the magma ocean. Maybe you would get um, uh, reactions on the surface uh, from, from a supercritical fluid on the surface, but um, I'm not confident that that could have ever formed around the moon. I'm not confident that there was enough um, gravity and enough mass of degas water around the moon to create a supercritical fluid um, against its surface. Uh, um, you know, maybe maybe I'm not right, and it could have, but but I think that um, I think it's not um, as likely as it as it was around the Earth. If it did, um, you sure would have expected pretty rapid uh, reactions with with the crust. But then uh, you might expect all of those minerals to then um, metamorphose back over time too. You know, through the energy of giant impacts and remelting and tidal heating of the of the lid. So, so the so the answer is, um, I think it's not at all as likely a scenario as it would have been on the Earth. I think if it did happen, it had a chance of being erased by time. Um, on the Earth, of course, it's been erased by other processes. Uh, but on on, the, on Mars, you know, there's a very nice um, paper that came out of Brown. You know, on on Mars, that could explain some of the crustal compositions that we see that supercritical fluid interaction. We also had a question about um, your thoughts on the style of overturn on the moon. Does your work provide any constraint on whether there might have been one major overturning body or alternatively many smaller blobs? Yeah, we, we looked into that at some length. Aaron Scheinberg um, did a bunch of studies on, on Mars to see if it was possible to get um, a degree one, you know, a one hemisphere giant blob overturn which could then do something like help explain the dichotomy in some way or the magnetic field or like other kinds of things like that. We found that on, on Mars, you just can't create that. What you need um, to create a, a single big blob of overturn is um, um, a, a very, very distinct two-layer density profile. Um, and you have that a little bit more on the moon. If you've got that high um, 
that uh, high oxide layer, um, but we still uh, were not able to really create a, a single degree one overturn. So it doesn't seem to be likely with the complexities of what we'd expect for the internal um, for the internal uh, density profile um, of real planets. And so, you know, there would be a relatively long wavelength. I don't have a number of what the wavelength would be. It's, um, I think we did calculate it. I just don't have it in my head. Um, and then followed by smaller wavelengths kind of clean up. And so it's, and so it's a, a multi-stage process. So, Lindy, one question is just thinking about the uh essentially ferro and anorthosites in the young ages. Uh, we've had some discussions that uh, maybe some of those very young ages might be actually impact melt seas, you know, where um, some of the younger yeah. basins or even earlier basins, uh, Will Vaughn here at Brown did some work on that. I, what's your opinion on that? Do you, you know, is there, is there a way to distinguish that? Uh, or is that a possibility, you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I would think that it would be because, because the melt sheet of an impact um, it's going to be made mostly of the target, isn't it? I mean, that's my understanding, and so and so it seems quite possible that you would do that, or that you would also have sort of secondary flotation potentially mm -hmm. if you had a big melt ocean. But I wonder if we couldn't detect that through other outcrops or through gravity. I'm not sure, um, but I think that's a really important thing to consider. You, you can get secondary melting through tidal flexing. You can get secondary melting through impacts. Um, I, I don't know a reason why not, although somebody might know one. Um, and so, and so that further confounds our ability to think that any of our ages we have are are definitive of magma ocean processes. Yeah, just just looking at the M and the P, you know, those are like in the range of large basins, and we know there's 30 or 40 of them. So it, it, it's it's something that should be considered. Yeah. I think. I, I and, completely agree. I totally going, agree. Yeah. Going back to the earlier part, you were mentioning the melting and flexing in the tidal lid and um, the possibility of extrusion and eruptions uh, in uh, the first uh, for a period of 100 to 200 million years as I understood it and so what what form like so basically you're flexing the lid so you're talking about fracturing and then basically I, I mean I this is kind of crude for me thinking as a physical volcanologist but basically squeezing out the magma from that uh, so you know we might look for long linear types of anomalies that uh, what, how can we test that idea? Oh, that's such a good question. I never thought about what the what the surface plan form might be. You know, when I've always looked at it radially and looking at the tidal flexing and with the in the bottom section of the lid where there's higher pressure um, and you know not up in the super brittle and, and relatively free top part. Um, I think that's something we should look into because maybe we could uh, prove or disprove. I love that. Another question from Larry Nyquist at Johnson. He asks, you gave a mechanism for initiating Mari volcanisms into impact basins. What accounts for continued volcanism into a given basin? And what is the role of radiogenic heating? Mm. Um, the, uh, the models that, 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 that we ran from the basins, because convection is so slow, um, and, it, and a lot of times it would continue to create melting for, for tens to hundreds I can't remember what the longest, more than 100 million years. Um, and, then, uh, and then there is sort of always this conduit, you know, maybe more things could erupt there. I can't really say anything definitive about that. Um, the role of radiogenics, I think, is really interesting. You know, if the radiogenics were really uh, concentrated in the creep, and if the creep is really concentrated on the near side, um, the way we see the potassium and, and so forth, uh, you know, then as Mark Wazorek showed, um, there could be a significant radiogenic heating profile there, but um, uh, it takes so much heat to cause um, material to actually, mantle material to melt and create something that looks like a basalt compositionally. Uh, and uh, presumably these things are happening at different depths. Um, it's hard for me to really it's hard for me to embrace radiogenic heat as a as a major driving force for continued basaltic volcanism. Okay, Lindy, those are the questions that we have, and uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I wonder if you would be so kind to take a, a minute or two to tell us about your very exciting Psyche mission. I, I can't imagine okay. you won't do, want to do that. <laughs> of course I would. This is my favorite thing. <laughs> 
again <laughs> <laughs> for inviting me. I really, I really hope that this has been um, a useful addition to the class. It's, it was really fun for me to put together the material. I hadn't put thought about it this way before. So with with Psyche, um, in fact, I stepped away from our monthly management review. We do an all day review every month, and it's today, uh, and it, which is fine. I'll just go back to it for the next three hours. Um, we are. <laughs> Uh, we are uh, trying to get out of phase B and into phase C in NASA Seek. So we're trying to finish our formulation and get to the build and launch stage. And uh, in order to get over that bridge, uh, we have to go through what we're calling PDR season, the preliminary design review season, which is 18 official uh, PDRs plus the really big one that NASA convenes for us next um, uh, March, uh, right before LPSC for a week. And then hopefully we get the go-ahead to go to phase C. Right now we're doing very well. I'm really happy with how the, the mission planning is going. We're on course to launch August 6, 2022, and uh, then cruise out there using solar electric propulsion, um, using our 900 kilograms of xenon, and our uh, spacecraft with the five-panel solar arrays extended is about the size of a single tennis court, cruise out to um, the metal asteroid Psyche and uh, rendezvous with it after 3.4 years. We'll orbit for 21 months if all goes well and figure out what the heck it is. Uh, you know, the ground-based observations are strongly indicative that it's metal. Uh, its density is too high to be stone, but it, uh, to be rock, you know, silicate rock, but it's also too low to be absolutely solid metal from what we know so far. We won't know we won't know till we get there what it what it really is, and uh, to me that's a very very exciting kind of um, exploration to do. Excellent. So thanks so much for that summary, and we're excited to in the upcoming weeks here to uh, really begin to do asteroid comparative uh, planetology, so to speak. And it's going to be a really exciting time to say nothing of having successfully landed on Mars just a couple of Isn't days. Isn't that ago. amazing? It's so it's amazing. amazing. <laughs> So, on, I don't know what, what you all thought, but I, when I first heard of the sky crane, I just thought that someone was joking. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's like, yeah, it's that what? You know, it's that, yeah. anyway. but the, the, the engineers at, at, at uh, Lockheed and JPL and all throughout NASA and the university community, it's just amazing, just amazing to watch. Uh, oh, really, really amazing, fun. amazing. How lucky we are to be in this world. Absolutely. So on behalf of David Kring at the LPI and myself, um, Lindy, we want to thank you very, very much. Um, and uh, I, I think to me that not only the excellent lecture, but I, I, I'm not sure I'll be able to go to sleep at night uh, thinking about Mars as a stranded embryo. It's a, it's a new a new vision for me. <laughs> so, so yeah, well, I, you know, it hasn't dulled my interest in Mars, but it, it certainly has put it in perspective. Um, so I, I want to just go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I just I just want to say that you know we need to remember that even though Mars had a very uh, you know sad early childhood, it's grown up to be a happy and well-adjusted planet. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, I, I, that'll put me right to sleep. That's good. I, I'm good good on that. Uh, so I, I just want to summarize. That, so again, uh, following on Lindy's really excellent uh, lecture on models for thermal evolution of the Moon, next week on December 5th we'll have lunar polar deposits in surface water. Uh, Dana Hurley at Johns Hopkins University APL. Applied Physics Lab and Ralph Milliken here at Brown will uh, share the podium there to discuss these issues and the uh, readings are already on the, the site. So um, then that'll be followed by December 11th. Uh, people will be at AGU, so we will not have class then, but the last class of the semester on December 19th, Future Exploration of the Moon, the road ahead, will be uh, given by uh, Apollo 17 lunar module pilot astronaut uh, Harrison Jack Schmidt. So we're really looking forward to that too particularly following up on uh, the NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine's uh, broad Amazing. discussion, really excellent discussion about um, the overall view ahead. So we're looking for Jack, um, who is very instrumental in many of these aspects, giving us some guidance on the road ahead. I would just finally say that these lectures are recorded, and um, and so they will be online uh, coming up soon. The, the other lectures are already online. Uh, next week's uh, readings are on the site and we encourage you to get prepared because it's going to be an exciting time for lunar water and polar deposits and surface water. Again, a good example of something that uh, through a combination of detailed data analysis improved technology, Alberta Saul here at Brown, Eric Carney, at Carnegie, et cetera, 
uh, really uh, reset our thinking about this. And since that time, there have been numerous discoveries about uh, the role of water on the surface, uh, and we'll hear about those next week. So very exciting times ahead. And uh, on behalf of David Kring and myself, um, you know, we, we uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks again, Landy. Thank you so much, David.